Hi, navigating the path to breakthrough, overcoming challenges and embracing God's promises. 2 Corinthians 4.17 tells us we view our slight, short-lived troubles in the light of eternity. We see our difficulties as the substance that produces for us an eternal weighty glory far beyond all comparison. In the powerful true words of Oswald Chambers, faith never knows where it is being led, but it loves and knows the one who is leading. Navigating the path to breakthrough, overcoming challenges and embracing God's promises. Want to know more? Hang around. Welcome, welcome to Lions Roar 38 Ministries. Amos 38 tells us, a lion has roared who will not fear or hear. The Lord God has spoken who can but prophesy. My name is George Magalhães and we are an apostolic ministry with a prophetic teaching edge. It is our passion, our mission to reignite, equip and release Christ-like disciples both locally and globally. We do that through our itinerant ministry, but as well as providing you with resources just like this one to help you, to aid you in your God-given calling. Today, we have a great topic, a great topic, bringing us to our main verse today. And as we heard at the beginning, the main verse comes from chapter 2, sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 17 so 2 corinthians 4 17 now reading from the new king james version for our light affliction which is but for a moment is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory amen amen oh come on here we are <laughs> here's my beautiful right here right next to me and she's got an amazing word this week for us so Amen. without further ado let me just give you a little quick introduction just so you know what what we're going to be speaking studying today yes we do have a study so today's words will be a study on navigating the path to breakthrough overcoming challenges and embracing god's promises so first sabrina my wife prophet sabrina here We'll give a simple intro, so a context into today's topic, and then we'll dive right into our study, covering the following specific questions. Yes, we're going to be covering, answering the following specific questions. Who is our Lord, specifically in times of adversity and attack? Number two. Who is our enemy? Very good. Number three. What is the enemy's reaction when we are close to God? Number four. What are some of the enemy's tactics? Six of the most common topic uh, tactics. And number five, what are some practical points we can take from today's study? Okay, let's so pray. let's pray. You pray. Lord, I thank you for this wonderful word. I thank you for the study that we have on today. I thank you for every single brother, every single sister that is online, that is listening, that is watching right now. We lift them up in your hands and we thank you for your spirit of wisdom and revelation is moving even as we speak right now. We thank you for miracles, signs and wonders. Follow your word wherever you go. Lord, as we declare your word, as we study your word today, Lord, we thank you for breakthrough. We thank you for breakthrough, Lord, in people's lives, in finances, in their health, in their marriages, in their workplaces, wherever they need a breakthrough. We thank you that there will be plenty of testimonies of your breakthrough tonight itself or today, wherever you are in the world. And we thank you, Lord, for you are absolutely good God. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. All right, here we go. Well, today let's dive into what happens when we are on the brink of a breakthrough and when we've just experienced one. We'll take a look at the challenges and growth that come with these transformative moments. Now, over the years in ministry, I mean, one of the most frequent questions we've heard is why it seems that the closer we get to God, the more challenges we face. Or sometimes, you know, even after experiencing a healing, it can feel like the same issues are resurfacing. resurfacing. Um, it's a common challenge and often people might 
return to, um, to the old habits simply because they are unsure of how to move forward. The Bible tells us that my people perish for lack of knowledge, which often comes from not being focused on God. Sometimes we need to remind ourselves that God is all powerful and greater than anything we face, including the enemy itself. Um, let's, let's start by reading in Hosea chapter 4 verse 6. All right, Hosea chapter 4 verse 6 from the Amplified Classic. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because you, the priestly nation, have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you, that you shall be no priest to me. Seeing you have forgotten the law of your God, I also forget your children. So the point of here is without knowledge, right? That, or should I say the knowledge of God, of the word of God, is crucial, as we read from, from this uh, passage, because it helps us truly grasp the practical application of who our Lord is and who, um, who we are in him and who is our enemy. As George introduced already today, in today's study, we, are, we will be examining and answering the following questions. First one, who is our Lord, specifically in times of adversity and attack? Second one, who is our enemy? Third one, what is the enemy's reaction when we are close to God? Number four, what are some of the enemy's tactics? And number five, what are some practical points we can take from today's study? Now, our study, number one, we're going to start. Who is our Lord in terms of adversity and attack? Mm, very important to know, right? To confidently trust in our walk with, with Jesus Christ, it is essential to understand who God is, isn't it? Knowing his heart for us is filled with hope, not just empty words, right? Give us the strength then to navigate any circumstances with faith and assurance. Then we also can be like Paul. We can grow confident like Paul, who boldly expressed his faith in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. Let's read it. 2 Timothy 1, verse 12. Again, reading from the Amplified Classic. And this is why I am suffering as I do. Still, I am not ashamed, for I know, perceive, have knowledge of, and am acquainted with him whom I have believed, adhered to, and trusted in and relied on. And I am positively persuaded that he is able to guard and keep that which has been entrusted to me and which I have committed to him until that day. Wow, what a wonderful scripture that explained quite a bit, right? So he is, our God is the creator of everything, the Alpha and the Omega. There is no one else like him and he has the final word in all things right? We're going to do a lot of scriptural uh, confirmation. So hope you guys write it down or we listen to it afterward. Let's read um, Colossians chapter 1 verse 16. Colossians 1 16, again, reading from the Amplified Classic. For it was in him that all things were created in heaven and on earth, things seen and things unseen, whether thrones, dominions, rulers or authorities, all things were created and exist through him by his service, intervention, and in and for him. So knowing he's a creator, when we surrender to God during our challenges, we can be confident. I mean, seriously, as these scriptures assures us that he is our refuge, our strength, our hope, our peace, and our source of power. Let's confirm it. George, you want to read Psalm uh, 46 verse 1? Psalm 46 verse 1, Amplified Classic. God is our refuge and strength mighty and impenetrable to temptation, a very present and well-proven help in trouble. Wow. See, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31 from the NKJV says, But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strengths. They shall mount up with wings like eagle. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So that shows who our God is when he is with us in all those circumstances. Let's keep reading who he is in those circumstances. So next one, you want to read it? Romans 15 verse 13 in the New King James Version. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm. So we understand who our creator is, right? So... Who is our Lord in terms of adversity and attack? 
So when we are in a, under all those pressure, who is he? So in times of adversity and attack, our Lord is our unshakable refuge and strength, like a sturdy anchor in a storm. As Paul expressed in 2 Timothy 1 at 12, we trust him because we know his faithful character. He is the creator of all, Colossians 1 16, and our ever present help, Psalm 46 1, which we've all just uh, gone through. With him, we saw above all challenges, renewed in strength, Isaiah 40 31, filled with hope and peace through his spirit, Romans 15 13. Now that we understand who is our Lord, we need to understand who is the enemy, to understand who is against us and why, right? We need to know the enemy. We need to, let's look at what the word of God first says about the enemy and its character. Let's read um, John chapter 8, verse 44. John 8, 44, Amplified Classic. You are of your father, the devil. And it is your will to practice the lusts and gratify the desires which are characteristic of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a falsehood, he speaks what is natural to him. For he is, he is a liar himself and the father of lies and of all that is false. <laughs> Now let's look at another verse which is still talk about uh, about the enemy. Isaiah 14 verse 12. Amen. Isaiah 14 verse 12. Again, Amplified Classic. How have you fallen from heaven, O light bringer and day star, son of the morning? How you have been cut down to the ground, you who weakened and laid low the nations, O blasphemous satanic king of Babylon. Now, we know that the devil is a liar from that scripture we've just read, right? Originally an angel created by God who was cast down out of heaven. Since it's all, it, since it was created and cast down, we can be confident that it is no match for God. Since God is with us, we, are, we have already won. Now, why is Satan so bothered, right, about us then? Because he's jealous of man's relationship with God. These are important to know why attacks come as well. Let's look at Job chapter 1 verse 9 to 10. Job 1, 9 to 10, Amplified Classic. Then Satan answered the Lord, Does Job reverently fear God for nothing? Have you not put a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have conferred prosperity and happiness upon him in the work of his hands. And his possessions have increased in the land. So, what, so as we've just heard in Job chapter 1, verse 9 to 10, Satan questions Job's loyalty to God, suggesting that Job's faithfulness is due to the blessing and protection he has received, rather than a genuine relationship with God. Now, this reflects a deeper envy and antagonism toward the relationship between God and humans. So, who is our enemy? Our enemy is the devil. A fallen angel who was cast out of heaven, Isaiah 14, verse 12. And he is the father of lies, John 8, 44. He opposes God's truth and seeks to destroy the relationship between God and humanity, as seen in his jealousy of Job's uh, faithfulness, Job 1, verses 9 to 10. However, Satan is no match for God. And with God on our side, we already have the victory. Now, here's the point. What is a real, uh, he's already jealous of us. Now, knowing that we are getting closer and closer to where we belong, to having a relationship with God, what is his reaction? So number three, what is the enemy's reaction when we are close to God? It goes without saying that Satan is unhappy when we have a strong relationship with God. Being the father of lies, it can't be trusted. Someone wise once says, and I really like that, son, if it was a conflict of sheer power, there would be no conflict. God is all powerful. So the conflict must be of another kind. It's actually a conflict of a character. See, it wants us to doubt God. It slanders God's character by causing people to question God's goodness. It tries to disrupt our journey and discourage us from moving forward in our faith. We must remember when we draw near to God, we step in his, into his glory and Satan's attempt to hinder us are just signs that we are on the right path. 
Recognizing those signs of the enemy help us to stay discerning rather than focusing on the negativity. It's all about being aware so that we can stand, stand firm and remain strong in our faith. Let's read uh, 1 Peter chapter uh, 5, verse 8. 1 Peter 5, verse 8, Amplified Classic. Be well balanced, temperate, sober of mind. Be vigilant and cautious at all times. For that enemy of yours, the devil, roams around like a lion roaring in fierce hunger, seeking someone to seize upon and devour. So what, so is, what? So what is the enemy? <laughs> a reaction when we are close to God? Come on. When we are close to God, the enemy reacts with increased opposition, seeking to devour and disrupt our faith as 1 Peter 5 warns. The devil, unable to overpower God, tries to make us doubt his goodness and character. The enemy's attacks are signs we're on the right path, and by staying vigilant and strong in faith, we overcome his attempts to hinder our spiritual growth. Mm. So what we're going to do is number four. What are some of the enemy's tactics? We'll be covering six of the most common tactics the enemy uses against us. Number one, increased temptation. Yeah, I'm pretty sure everybody is like um, familiar with this one. Increased temptation by the enemy is found in the story of Jesus te uh, being tempted in the wilderness. Um, Matthew chapter 4 verse um, 1 to 11 in this passage Jesus is led into the wilderness by the spirit to be tempted by the devil after fasting for 40 days and 40, uh, and, uh, 40 nights 40 days and, and nights Jesus is confronted um, with a series of intense temptation now the devil tries to tempt Jesus to turn stone into bread to throw himself down from the temple and worship him in exchange for all the kingdoms of the world now this story shows us how the enemy increased temptation particularly when jesus at is at um, a vulnerable point after fasting for 40 days and night you know he hasn't eaten and all those things um take notes the first thing he talked about was to uh, change the stone into bread right despite the intense pressure jesus respond to each temptation with scripture demonstrating how to win win uh we stand increased temptations through reliance on God's word and steadfast faith. Number two, comp um, complacency to avoid opposition. Let's look at Revelation chapter 3, verse 15 to 16. Revelation 3, 15 to 16, the Amplified Classic. I know your record of works and what you are doing. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were cold or hot? So that because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Now, this passage addresses the danger of being compliancy as a church in Laodicea was criticized for being lukewarm in their faith. The enemy attack sometimes make you feel like, you know, I, I'm not, I, I, I don't want to do anything. I just, I will do something, but I know I need to do something. At least I'm doing some bit. That's what being warm is about. You're not doing the most that you can, giving you, you the right standard unto the Lord. Yeah. Number three, the lie that we are not good enough for God and stuck going nowhere. Let's look at Exodus chapter 3, verse 11 to 12. You want to read that? Exodus 3, 11 to 12 in the New King James Version. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Wow. See, as we've, uh, we've just heard, when God called Moses to lead the Israelites out of Egypt, Moses questioned his own worthiness and capability, saying, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God then what does God do? God reassure him of his presence and power despite Moses on securities. This shows God's character, right? Number four, many of you are, are very familiar with this one, increased demonic oppression. See, often when a breakthrough is near, we might face uncertainties um, that make us question whether, wow, is God hearing our prayer? 
Or is, oh, well, is he ready to answer? Is he going to answer it? How about this is just a sign that we are on the verge of something significant, of that breakthrough to happen, you know, that, that last push, right? And we can trust that God is working on our behalf, even when it feels like we are in the midst of an impossible storm. The story of Daniel praying and fasting, seeking, understanding about a vision he received is a good example. After three weeks of intense prayer, an angel appeared to him. Let's read from uh, Daniel chapter 10, 12 to 14. Daniel 10, 12 to 14 in the New King James Version. Then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I have come because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. For I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision refers to many days yet to come. So as we've just heard, the angel shared that he was delayed by a powerful demonic force called the Prince of Persia Kingdom, which was resisting his mission. Even though Daniel was so close to receiving a breakthrough in understanding and revelation, significant spiritual opposition came right before it was about to happen. This shows how the enemy often tries to hinder us just when we're on the brink of a breakthrough. Number five. Hope I'm not going too quick for you all. Number five, fear and intimidation. Fear and intimidation are tactics the enemy uses to unsettle our hope and make us question our breakthrough, right? For example, we've seen people who were healed, right? They were healed and um, then they come back with, um, they, they faced a, a return of symptom after some time they were healed, right? And they, they doubt it. They, they, this doesn't mean that the healing wasn't real. Rather, it means that the enemy is trying to intimidate them into thinking they've fallen back to where they started. Um, I call it an illusion because it's not the truth. You've been healed. But you get, you get those things after what people say to us, oh, you know, I have this symptom. I, I don't know what happened. Did I open it or did I do this? Did I do that? But what truly matters is not what the enemy is giving you as an illusion, but what truly matters is how we decide to respond to this false evidence in our life. Now, the story of Job um, fits perfectly an example of fear and intimidation of, by the enemy. Job chapter 1 verse 2 describes Job. In one to two. Oh, sorry, yeah. Job 1 to 2 um, describe um, Job's initial prosperity and the subsequent attacks by the enemy. Now, despite this deep suffering, including physical affliction and the loss of his health, Job's faith in his healing and restoration was tested. Now, the enemy tried to make Job fear that his suffering meant he has lost everything. We all know the, the story, right? But Job's story ultimately showed that the breakthrough of restoration was still on the horizon. I mean, he got double portion going from nothing and that's it. It's all gone. Fear and intimidation to, you know, let's look at Job chapter 42 verse 10. Job 42 10, New King James Version. And the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Wow. So after Job had prayed for his friend, the Lord restored his fortune and gave him twice as much as he had before. Now, despite the apparent setbacks and suffering Job faced, his breakthrough came in the end, demonstrating that initial affliction and doubts were part of the illusion and not the final outcome. That is very important to understand. The story shows us that when, when symptoms or challenges return, they do not negate the reality of God's works or promises. It's our response to those challenges, to these challenges, that determines our experience of God's truth and breakthrough. Number six, desperation. Desperation is another way the enemy tries to keep us from experiencing our breakthrough. We might get so desperate to solve our problem. I mean, we've all been there that we would try to handle everything on our own or even dictate our solutions to God and say, this is how it needs to happen. Then I know God is there, right? 
the desperation can block our ability to self, uh, to fully surrender to him and trust in his perfect timing, wisdom, and perfect solution. I mean, if we take 1 Samuel um, chapter 13, 8 to 14, for example, we see King Saul's impatient leads him to offer a burnt sacrifice himself rather than waiting for the prophet Samuel as God had commanded. Now, Saul's decision to act on his own rather than waiting for God's timing resulted in his rejection as king. And then we have in Job, in, in Job, Job chapter 38 verse 2, we read, Who is it that obscure my plans with words without knowledge? That's what, um, the, what this verse does. It reflects God's response to Job who questioned and tried to understand God's ways and timing. So desperation can lead us into this path. So far today, we've already answered some very common questions in regards to our main study today, which is navigating the path to breakthrough, overcoming challenges and embracing God's promises. So we've covered and we answered who is our Lord, specifically in times of adversity and attack. We've covered who is our enemy. We've covered what is the enemy's reaction when we are close to God. We've just covered what are some of the enemy's tactics. We covered six of the most common tactics. And our final question we're going to be covering right now is what are some practical points we can take from today's study? I just realized the green thing of the tea just transparented. Anyways, <laughs> so number five, what are some practical points we can take from today's study? All right. So we have an incredible resource at our disposal, right? And I've always, I've been saying that, not always, I've been saying that for like a couple of weeks now. We have an open book of solutions. Now, God is not our enemy, but our ally, ready to help us if we allow him, if we don't allow ourselves to be deceived by the enemy, right? Here are some practical tips and prayers to support us when the enemy comes at us with its lies, right? Number one. When we're going through a storm and waiting for our breakthrough, remember that God prepares a table for us even in the presence of our enemies. Sounds simple, but that the reality, the blessing that God has put in our life, knowing that we are not alone in our struggles and boldly, boldly declare, because you're trusting, boldly declare, declaring this truth can bring us peace and strengthen our faith during our challenging times. Do you want to read the verse? Psalm 23 verse 5, New King James Version. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Amen. As we've just heard, this verse emphasizes that even in the midst of adversity, God provides and blesses us, reassuring us of his presence and care. Number two. We must pray for guidance during times of temptation, knowing that God's strengths and character are far greater than any challenge we face. With his powerful guidance, we can confidently overcome difficulties and remain steadfast in our faith. It's very important. You want to read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, New King James Version. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to men. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Wow. But with temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. This verse reassures us that God is faithful and powerful. Breathe. Yes. <laughs> I'm trying to cover everything. Um, that God is faithful and powerful more than enough to guide us through temptation and challenges, providing a way for us to overcome them. We have a way. We always have a way with God. If there's no way, he makes way for us. Number three, embrace your authority and trust that God's promises are always uh, true and fulfilled. We have been given power over the enemy's lies, and it's important to use its authority to affirm and align with what God has desired for us. You want to read it? 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20, Amplified Classic. For as many as are the promises of God, they all find their yes answer in him, Christ. For this reason, we also utter the amen, so be it, to God through him, in his person and by his agency, to the glory of God. Wow. 
This verse highlights that God's promises are always fulfilled in Christ, and it encourages to stand firm in he, in this truth because this is the truth that you can actually speak out with authority, right? Luke 10, verse 19. Luke 10, verse 19 in the New King James Version. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now, this verse underscores the authority given to us to overcome the enemy, the enemy's lies, and affirm what God desires for our life, to you that authority, right? Number four, we must stand, stand firm against the enemy's lies and they will retreat. Hold fast to God's word and, and rest assured that having done all you can, the victory is already yours. James 4 verse 7, New King James Version. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, this verse encourages us to resist the enemy with the promise that he will flee, it will flee from us. If, um, read the next one. Ephesians 6 verse 13, New King James Version. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand. Wow. Now this verse highlights the importance of standing firm in God's word and reassures us that having done all we can, we can confidently rely on God's victory. Now finally, while challenges are part of the journey to breakthrough, there are also opportunities for growth and deeper faith in God's promises. Now allow me to finish with 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4 verse 13 from the AMPC. 17. Mm, 17. Sorry. So 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. Um, For our light momentary affliction, this slight distress of the passing hour is ever more and more abundantly preparing and producing and achieving for us an everlasting weight of glory beyond all measure, ex um, excessively surpassing all comparisons and all calculation, a vast and trans transcendent glory and blessedness, blessedness never to cease. Amen. Mouthful. It is Navigating <laughs> the path to breakthrough, overcoming challenges, and embracing God's promises. Now, if you are listening for the first time, you've never heard about Christianity in this manner, you're probably wondering, wow, what is that? And you probably just had an experience with God himself. Because yes, the Christian God is not just some picture, it's not just some statue, it's not just some cross on a building. The Christian God is very much alive. He died on that cross, but he came back to life. And the word of God is very clear. It says in 1 John 5, 4 to 5, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. I want to ask you, where are you putting your faith? Is it in money? Is it in uh, vain things, collection of things in your life? Is it in women? Is it in men? Is it in your guru? Is it in your whatever it is? You're putting your faith in something. And you wouldn't be here just by accident. This is a divine appointment. This is a divine appointment. God's word goes on to say in John 3, 16 to 17, it's very clear. And he says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's talking about Jesus Christ. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So what do I have to do? 1 John 1 verse 9 tells us the very first thing that we need to acknowledge is if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh, that's the dirty word that nobody wants to talk about right now in the world. But guess what? Sin, 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 sin. Wake up. Sin is real. Sin took Jesus to that cross mm. so that we will not have to pay for it. Sin, in its most simplistic def definition, is when we try to live our lives without God. And the Word of God is very clear. It says that the Creator Himself, Father God, our Lord, created the whole universe. And the only creation He created in His image, in His image, is us, humanity, because He loves us that much. Not only did He create us in His image, but He gave us authority of all the things of the earth. That is, His Word goes on to say. 
but you can't ha hold any authority if you're not under his covering if you're not uh, if you're not submitted to god as your lord and savior as your father as your god if you've got other things on the side it doesn't work like that so what do you need to do well look at the screen it's very simple it is very simple cost jesus very dearly but it's very simple it's a simple and free gift of grace it's god's grace romans 10 9 to 10 goes on to say that if you confess with your mouth the lord jesus and believe in your heart that god has raised him from the dead you will be saved so come to him as you are and he will save you just speak it out like i'm speaking to you right now for with a heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation that means the matter of the heart is the heart of the matter or the other way the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart it all comes down to your heart so what you believe so right now are you desperate do you need a breakthrough then you need to call out to jesus right now you need to make jesus your lord and savior declare it with your mouth stop that car if you're driving right now if you're in the workplace who cares go to the bathroom go wherever go and speak to jesus right now he's very real he's waiting for you this is your opportunity and he will save you it's guaranteed just go to him as you are but it doesn't end there titus 3 verse 5 ephesians 2 verse 8 acts 1 verse 8 and many more go on to say then then he saves you so by faith you exercise faith in the gift of grace as though as you can see on the screen by grace through faith it's grace is god's part faith is your part not that you're buying salvation but you still need to exercise faith to accept that gift to of grace to believe the gift of god washing away our sins and giving us the new joy of the indwelling spirit holy spirit and you will receive power when the holy spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere what does that mean george well that means that after you give your life to jesus and we're going to be praying together right now i'm gonna we're gonna have the privilege to pray with you together then you invite holy spirit the very spirit of god to come and live inside of you no longer will he just come into a building into a church synagogue temple wherever you go no he will come and live inside of you and the word of god says that you become his indwelling uh, place his uh, the temple of the holy spirit you invite him he comes bearing gifts he comes with power spiritual power and gifts that he will equip you and and he will train you and he'll comfort you and he'll correct you and he'll guide you through your life journey so that your life will bring glory to christ jesus so that your life and the light of god will it shine in your you. life and through your life and for him throughout the world are you ready let's pray together do you want to pray you pray <laughs> all right lord i thank you right now for this privilege for my brother and my sister that have cried out to you and right now as your word shows us lord we cry out to your holy spirit and we say fill us afresh with a baptism of holy spirit and fire come lord set us alight for you so that the world will come and watch us burn for you revival fire when i mean burn i mean it's a revival fire it's a spiritual empowerment god wants to empower you lord we say yes we say more of you we surrender to you yes use our lives for your glory lord yes in the mighty name of jesus Amen, amen and amen glory to god hallelujah. hallelujah all right i encourage you please if you've made that decision today get connected with a bible teaching holy spirit filled church you need to be connected with the body of christ mm -hmm. it'll give you a place to learn to grow to serve to be served to it's an encouraging family of god the kingdom of god's family and he created us to be together so that we can overcome things in this world. Remember, we are in a fallen world right now. And until God comes back, we are living in a world where the enemy is roaming around, deceiving people. We need each other to hold each other, not just accountable, but to hold each other up, to strengthen each to other. To edify each other. Exactly, through this journey. So if you don't have a place for whatever reason and you need some help, send us a message, send us an email, we can do our best to find wherever you are 
uh, a Bible teaching, a Holy Spirit filled church that you can go and attend. If you can't attend in person for some reason, there are some countries that are being very anti Christian, very uh, persecuting Christianity a lot. You can go, you can connect with an online community. It's best to go in person, but you can connect with an online community. Amen. Amen. All right. This brings us to our second part of the program, which is called the collective, where we spend time with those that are watching, those that are listening. We pray, prophesy, whatever Holy Spirit leads us to do. If you have specific prayer requests, please write them down in the Facebook live chat section already, so that we can get onto them. If this was your first time, if you gave your life to Jesus. Or you're just watching it for the first time. Drop us a line. Let us know who you are, your name, where you're watching from. It's always encouraging. It's always exciting for us to know who's watching, who is being blessed. And share. Please share these messages with those you know need to hear this. Amen? Amen. All right. This brings us to the collective. 